Good evening and welcome. I'm Ann Craybill, Director and CEO at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. And as part of our programming, we have added culinary experiences to bring together the community, to connect food, to connect with each other, and to our exhibitions. We were so excited to bring this experience, exploring 200 years of African-American culinary history to connect to our exhibition, African-American Art in the 20th Century, now on view through January 2021, which you can all see now in person since we have reopened. Unfortunately, we were not able to do this dinner in person presently. Hopefully one day in the near future we will, but we are so pleased that Chef Azizi Young and author Tony Tipton Martin have agreed to a live conversation and cooking demonstration virtually. Be forgiving. It is hard enough to do cooking demonstrations, but to do it live and virtual. Um, so this is going to be a, a wonderful um, conversation and demo, but there's always going to be probably some glitches with the virtual um, uh, experience. Even though we are gathered virtually, I want to continue a practice we began when we were gathering in person of acknowledgments. The Westmoreland Museum of American Art is situated upon the traditional lands of the Adena, Hopewell, Monongahela, Delaware, Shawnee, and Seneca Cayuga peoples. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude and acknowledge the genocide and continuous displacement of indigenous peoples. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built this country during the colonial era and beyond. We acknowledge the harm inflicted upon indigenous communities and people of color across our country, which guides and inspires our work as a museum. I would also like to acknowledge the wonderful staff at the Westmoreland for making this possible, including Maggie Greer and Dara Resnick, who are masterfully working behind the scenes, and Mona Wiley, Public Programs Manager, who arranged for this wonderful program. I am sure we will all leave with new perspectives and an appetite, and now I'd like to welcome Mona Wiley, Public Programs Manager, who will introduce tonight's program. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Anne. Hey, Mona. <laughs> All right. Welcome to our virtual discussion and cooking demo with author Tony Tipton Martin and Chef Aziza Young. Today we're going to get to hear Tony discuss a little bit about the evolution of African American cooking and her book Jubilee Recipes from Two Centuries of African American Cooking, while Chef Z will demonstrate how to make recipes adapted from Tony's book. The recipes Chef Z will demo include hibiscus tea, apple hot toddies, mm -hmm. pickled shrimp, salmon croquettes with sweet potato salad and green bean a la creole. All of these recipes are located in Tony's book, so make sure you purchase this. In a moment, we'll get to meet our speakers, but before that, I would like to tell you a little bit about them. Tony Tipton Martin is a two-time James Beard award-winning author, culinary journalist, and community activist who has dedicated her career to building a healthier community. Her highly acclaimed works include Jubilee, Recipes from Two Centuries of African American Cooking, and The Jemima Code, Two Centuries of African American Cookbooks, a book that celebrates the important legacy of African American cooks and their cookbooks. The Jemima Code also won the 2015 Art of Eating Prize and the 2015 Certificate of Astounding Contribution to Publishing from the Black Caucus of the Library Association. Tony founded a 501c3 nonprofit organization that promotes the connection between cultural heritage, food, and health. She has appeared on CBS News, The Dish, and was guest judge on Bravo's Top Chef. Tony also was profiled in the 35th annual 2016 Etna African American History Calendar, and First Lady Michelle Obama invited Tony to the White House twice. Chef Aziza Young has a passion for transforming traditional recipes into extraordinary meals. In 2014, a year after opening her catering business, Aziza was cast on Fox's Hell's Kitchen and worked with Chef Gordon Ramsay. Since then, she has been a rising star on television and in Philadelphia and in the Philadelphia culinary scene. On April 23, 2019, she appeared on one of her favorite shows, The Food Network's Chopped, and was a runner-up. In addition to her many accomplishments, she has also done several pop-up dinners around the city of Philadelphia. In the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Chef Z saw a need in the community. People needed food. 
So she reached out to some of her chef friends and they began cooking 100 meals a day for low income families and senior citizens. Later, Chef C and Ben from South Philly Barbacoa partnered with 215 Alliance, World Center Kitchen, CMAC, and other organizations to create the People's Kitchen. She is also part of a nonprofit organization called Everyday Eats Philly. The mission is to help low income families with food and everyday essentials. All right, that's enough for me. Let's meet our guests. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are both of you? I'm, I'm doing good. Fine. All right, great. All right, so to make it much easier, I'm gonna hang out backstage. I'm gonna let you two just do your thing, have a conversation. I did wanna remind everybody watching that we do have a Q&A at the end. So make sure you add all of your questions in the comments um, and I will keep track of them and I will be asking your questions at the end. Awesome. All right, welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Mona. Thank you to Maggie and Dara and Kyrie and this incredible technical team. Um, I am so impressed and looking forward to uh, how everything turns out tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm also so excited for something really crazy, which is the Chef Z. How did you choose red as uh, your the color for your linens and your background? You said, how did I? Yeah, yeah, why, Sorry. why red, why red? You said, how did I do my lemons and stuff? No, your red color. Why did you choose red as the color for your linens and your chopping board? I And the reason I ask is because I always wear, wear red to my events in honor of the Aunt Jemima bandana. Oh, really? Well, yeah. honestly, I just, I, I love the color red as far as backgrounds um, is, is an easy pop, but I'm going to go with what you said. That's why okay. I think red. <laughs> well, I was thinking maybe you did. I even, you can't see it, but I even have on my bandana pin. So uh, when oh. I don't have red, I can wear a bandana all the time. So I just thought it was so cool when I came in uh, to the view of the kitchen and saw that you had red. People will think we coordinated it. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Um, so I want to thank you especially uh, for your willingness to uh, put this whole thing together. I know that cooking on screen can be a lot. Um, the prepping and all of that advanced work that makes it all look so sexy um, on television. <laughs> so um, I'm just thrilled to be here with you and, uh, and um, get, to get started. Wonderful. I'm thrilled to be here too. It's, um, it is definitely my pleasure to be able to cook um, some of the recipes out of um, Jubilee. I love this book. Um, I, you should see it, it has so many, I have so many um, sticky notes <laughs> in this book from recipes that, I that I've just enjoyed making from out of here and, and you know, turn it into my own. So thank you, um, West Island um, Museum, and thank you, Tony, for having me. Well, great. I'm thrilled. I'm really thrilled. And I'm glad that uh, you're enjoying the book. Um, I want to share with the audience a little bit of the background while you get started on, on our first uh, course. Um, I will tell you uh, guys that this whole concept for me started last fall when we were contemplating what to do about a book tour. And I had the idea that I would travel the country and invite uh, chefs in each city to prepare recipes from Jubilee. And so um, I was so excited when uh, Westmoreland uh, selected Chef Z. Um, we hadn't met before. Um, but, you know, this is really a moment for us to celebrate Black excellence in the food industry, not just in our past, but also in our present. And so Chef is going to... Um, talk a little bit about her choices and why she made them. And I will share uh, in between um, a little bit about each dish. So um, why don't we just get started? Um, the first dish is pickled shrimp. Can everybody hear okay? Huh? Yeah? I, I can't hear. <laughs> okay. Um, the first dish is pickled shrimp. And, I'm sorry. Um, 
Jeff is having some um, sound issues, so I'll just keep talking. Um, so the pickled shrimp is part of the is one of the recipes in the appetizer section of Jubilee. Yeah. Um, it was important for me in in the telling of the story of African American cooking to demonstrate that we had uh, proficiencies as caterers, um, as professional cooks who cooked um, exquisite food. Um, that it that we didn't um, cook only uh, food associated with poverty and hard times. No. Um, and this pickled shrimp is a wonderful. Um, uh, expression of summer, of the Southern season. Um, and in Jubilee, I yes, recommend I that you even take the shrimp out of the brine out that is in and it on top of the salad. And so there's multiple ways that you can enjoy this dish um, other than it's just really spectacularly beautiful uh, in the jar. And okay. um, let's see, can you hear us now? I can't. <laughs> if you're, no, it's okay. I couldn't well, hear. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Right. We're just going to toss it over to you now. You can talk about. Um, I gave some background on the dish, and you can tell us a little bit about your, your what you've got going there. All right. Uh, we're doing a pickle shrimp dish. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> This has got a lovely mise en place there. Everything's ready to yes. go. Um, we don't think about our uh, cooks in that way, but our African African American ancestors were uh, trained, in, classically trained, many of them, um, even during enslavement. And so they would have understand, understood concepts like having all of your ingredients organized. That's just so. So with the pickle shrimp, what we're going to do first is um, on the stove, I have two quarts of shrimp stock. I have two quarts of shrimp stock. In that shrimp stock, I'm going to add my onions. We're going to turn this on. So we're going to add the onions. Celery, and our bay leaves. And we're going to let that come up, okay? In our shrimp. And we're only going to cook these for about two to three minutes until they turn pink. While they're cooking in a bowl, I'm going to mix together our vinegar. But before then, I want to toast our pickling spice. I want to bring out the flavor of the pickling spice. So we're going to just toast these, move this to the back burner. Can you toast, just uh, would you toast other... Um Spices, if you had them um, also, is this a practice you like to do or is this unique to the pickling spices? Well, actually, this is unique to this recipe. Um, usually when I'm pickling something, I put everything in, in the pot. However, okay. by pickling, by toasting the pickling seasonings, mm -hmm. um, you kind of bring out that flavor. You bring out the flavor right. and it adds more flavor to your shrimp. So continue, I'm gonna add the vinegar, it's white wine vinegar. 
lemon juice, onions, some fresh tarragon, some fresh dill. And I'm going to slice a couple of limes. I know in the recipe book it says lemons, but I like limes. <laughs> and I just want to add a different element to it. That's all. Of course. And limes have a can be sweet, really. Uh, ha they can have a different type of uh, bittersweetness to them. So I think that will give it a nice punch. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to slice these and we're going to add them to the bowl. And we're also going to add after this. go so now i got habanero peppers awesome because i like the spiciness of the habanero peppers good and some fresh zested garlic in here i love garlic i put it in everything Yes, it's so good. Yeah. It's amazing. It, it just changes the flavor profile. Um, and we wouldn't need as much salt, um, I think, if we were a little bit heavier handed on the aromatic vegetables. And, and like you said, using lemon and lime, they, they, do, they just brighten up the flavor of a dish mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. So I'm just mixing this up. So that when the shrimp is done, we'll add that to the mixture. Now, you only want to toast these. You only want to toast the pickling seasoning until you get the aroma. Okay? You don't want to burn them. Which happens faster than you mm, think. It smells great. It yeah. does. It really does. So you have to watch it. Now, one of the things that we can tell mention here is that uh, the idea of pickled shrimp, people may be thinking, well, I had that in my Southern household and it's not especially African-American, um, but it definitely is a reflection of our Caribbean uh, heritage, uh, where a dish similar to this is uh, Eskimo fish. And um, it involves poaching, um, a variety of fish and then marinating it in a vinaigrette. And that's what we're doing here, only we're using shrimp. I'm gonna add some water. All right. So the brine is ready for the shrimp. Once the shrimp is done, we're going to strain the, the shrimp and we're going to add that to the brine and put it in the fridge so that it can cool off. One thing I liked about this dish, or I actually loved about this dish, is that you could pair it with so many things. Um, a salad um, or eat it by itself is great with cocktail sauce because it's already pickled, so you have that nice twang to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's just an amazing um appetizer or or first course or anything <laughs> right right, right. It's amazing snack and, and good for those good. that are following the protein like the high protein lifestyle because it's shrimp is a lean source of protein and so um it does make a nice first course um or the protein source on your salad as i was saying earlier but i reminded everyone in the head notes of the book that you have to be careful about that pickling spice and use a tongue or a fork to extract the shrimp out of the brine as you'll see shortly um, to make sure you don't uh the spices in your salad so i'm gonna check on the shrimp okay and they look just about done. We want them to be a bright pink. And that usually happens pretty quickly. And the, all of those aromatic vegetables will just penetrate into the flavor of the shrimp, um, which gives them a, a, a liveliness of their own. 
people often wonder why restaurant food is um, so so much more delicious than the things we can sometimes prepare at home. And, and you, what you're seeing is layering on a flavor in the dish. So the shrimp has its own flavor brought out by those aromatics um, as he's simmering them. Um, and then they're gonna also go into a very good broth. So I'm cut the burn off, the shrimp is done. Oh, good. I'm just gonna strain this liquid out. While you have that, Brian. And I'm gonna take uh, the shrimp. Sorry. Go ahead, Tony. <laughs> Right, you're, it's your turn. I was just going to say, people often ask me, that's, you have to throw that away, and you could post more shrimp with it, um, or, and it would be fine. You have it yes, you, you definitely can save it. You don't have to throw the broth out. That's, for me, a beginning stage of a stock. Right. Um, that's actually what I cooked the shrimp in. Um, I had shrimp from a previous recipe. I saved it. And then I used that to cook this shrimp in. Just so right. that we can have more flavor. The more flavor you have, the better your food's going to taste. Absolutely. And what I do is um, pour, strain out all of those aromatics so that you have a very clear, pristine broth. And then uh, store it in ice cube trays. Right, if you freeze the broth and um, put them in ice cube trays, then you can pop those ice cube tray, the cubes into a bag or a container in your freezer. And you'll only need to um, take out a few as you need them to give a dish more flavor wherever, whenever you're making fish in some kind of a uh, sauce. It's a great tip. I do that with um, my vegetable stock and uh -huh. my beef stock. Cause when I cook other dishes um, in like a sous vide, when you vacuum seal the bag, you can't put liquid in there. So if you have everything already right. in ice cubes, it'll, it works better. So I'm going to toss this up and we're going to put it in the fridge for it to cool off. Now, We actually already have some eight. <laughs> the miracle of live TV. That <laughs> so here's the pickle shrimp that we have made already. Let me put it in this camera. See how pretty it is? Yeah. So, and what I made was a salad. This is a nice kale salad. It has kale, broccolini, um, um, radicchio in there. On top, I have craisins, um, uh, pumpkin seeds. There you go. I couldn't think of it. What I'm also going to add are some olives because um, it'll pair nicely with the shrimp. So I also have some olives that I'm going to put on here. Mm -hmm. And some roasted um, portobello mushrooms, and red peppers. Nice. And now the pickle shrimp on top. And honestly, I, I love, me personally, I love the pickling vegetables that are in here. So if I get an onion on here, then that's fine. The, the uh, seasonings, I don't want. <laughs> the, the allspice, the nutmeg, I don't want because, you know, no one wants to bite down on that and hurt their tooth. Yeah, you know, that's the problem. Um, the idea is it's really a pickled shrimp um, as an appetizer. And when I thought about adding it to a salad, I realized that I had opened a you know, a little bit of a Pandora's box about that mm -hmm. uh, pickling spice. But while you're spooning that up, I will show the audience the gorgeous photo, Jarrell Guy's photo. Can you see that? I don't know how to turn it. Oh, there. This is the way that the dish looks in on the pages of Jubilee. 
Um, and so it gives you that real sense of, of home cooking and comfort um, and the beauty of uh, someone who has prepared these for you from, you know, from scratch. All right. And there you have it, a pickled shrimp salad. Bravo, looks great. Okay, well, um, so the next uh, dish that you're going, or the next uh, item you're going to prepare for us is the hibiscus tea. Yes. Um, um, hibiscus tea um, comes from a long tradition of Africans, uh, West Africans and the preparation of teas and medicinal uh, broth. Um, the, in West Africa, um, our ancestors um, simmered all kinds of herbs and uh, leaves, including um, something that was called leopard tongue. Um, and it, it left a red hue to um, the water. Um, by the time our, fam our ancestors migrate to the Caribbean, um, that dish evolves, that drink evolves, and it uh, is made with the local, what the locals had there, um, sorrel leaves or hibiscus leaves. Um, and so that dish, that drink, took on the identity and the name of Bissac in, in the Caribbean. So that once we had enslaved Africans here in, a, in the U.S., um, they tried various other things to recreate that idea of a red beverage. Um, and and uh, we can see that all throughout history, including to mm -hmm. freedom, when uh, red drinks uh, became part of our celebration um, history and heritage, um, in particular celebrating um, the Christmas holiday. So, so this is uh, based on um, hibiscus flowers and I'll let take let you take it away. Thank you. So what I'm doing now is I am putting in, in this pot is two quarts of water. Um, I've added um, two cups of dry hibiscus, um, cloves, cinnamon sticks. I have lemon zest here. We're going to put in here or oh, orange zest. My, now lemon zest and fresh sliced ginger. Now we're gonna add all this to the pot all at once. And we're gonna, we're gonna cook it. We're gonna bring it up to a boil and let it cook for 15 minutes. Even before it cooks, if, if I'm sure you can see, I hope you can see. <laughs> Um, yeah. The water is already turning red. This just so tea vivid. is amazing. Okay. It is amazing. It tastes good with the with the zest from the orange and the zest from the lemon, um, the cloves, the cinnamon sticks. It brings out the flavor of the hibiscus. It's an amazing drink. Um, I've had this with champagne. <laughs> I've had it by itself, but I, it's, it's a nice cocktail. <laughs> it is a nice cocktail. At one of the dinners uh, in Houston at Lucille's, um, Chef Chris Williams' brother uh, has a uh, vodka that um, mm. he is bottling. And so for the evening, we had the hibiscus tea cocktails uh, made with his highway vodka. They were amazing. Wow, oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> now, I don't want you to wait super long for the um, tea, so we have some made for you. <laughs> we do. <laughs> so once the tea has chilled, You want to strain it because you want to keep everything in there. You want to make sure all the flavors stay in there. And look how yeah. pretty. And if you can let it sit, is. you know, to cool off while it uh, still has the solids in it, that's that you get that last burst of flavor uh, before straining. And I also pressed out the uh, use the back of the spoon in my strainer to press to press. Press out the uh, excess flavor and liquid from the pulp. 
you do that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's get some. Rinse this off. Let's get some of this amazing pulp. And let's put it in this strainer. Mm. Now, I'm gonna show you something real quick on here. Here's the ginger and the hibiscus. And of course you have the lemon zest in there. Oops, you didn't see that at all. <laughs> yeah. Nope, as a matter of fact, we'll so see. you have the ginger here, the hibiscus, um, of course the lemon zest, everything is in there. Now, did you have a hard time squeezing. finding the finding the hibiscus in your area? No, there's actually a herb store that I go to because I make my own teas, and okay. hibiscus is actually an ingredient that I use regularly. Okay. Uh, you can find it in um, ethnic grocery stores, um, in the island section. Um, in the Latin section, um, I found it there. Um, but I also offer a cheat in Jubilee, which is to use, um, if you're just in a hurry and want to make a vivid cocktail, then um, I uh, recommend that you try using um, hibiscus tea bag, which you can steep really uh, strongly and then um, dilute as you see, as you wish. And then just a lemon on top for garnish. Beautiful. Are you going to flip that vodka in there or champagne or that later? We're going to do that later when the cameras are <laughs> off. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Okay. Well, well, next up, we're going to talk about the African-American expertise in frying. And we all know that from, uh, from our, um, celebrity as uh, fried chicken and fried fish cooks. Um, but maybe one of the things that uh, folks will learn by reading Jubilee um, is that we were excellent uh, experts at making croquettes. Um, croquettes are a, a concept of taking little bits of leftover meat um, that's already been cooked in most cases and putting it together with some kind of a binding, whether that is um, mashed potatoes, or you can make a, a roux, a flour-based roux, a white sauce to um, hold the fish and its aromatic vegetables together. Um, either one of those works. But what I write about in Jubilee is how confusing it was to study all of the African-American cookbooks that had so many different names for our um, habit and proficiency in frying fish. Uh, they called them cutlets. They called them uh, all, all different kinds of things, fish balls, um, codfish balls. And so this comes again out of a diasporan tradition that um, our enslaved ancestors um, worked um, out with whatever ingredients they could find in their region. Um, and then it migrate, these dishes migrate onto our uh, table as we have independence and have more freedom in the choice of what we want to serve. So salmon uh, comes along um, in the industrial age when, um, when canned fish became popular. So here I have a can of salmon. What I'm gonna do it's already strained. So now what I'm gonna do is use the fork and combine the meat, the skin, and make sure the bones are well incorporated. These bones are very soft, so you don't have to worry about them poking you in your gums or, or anything like that. Just make sure that you are using the fork and mashing everything really well. When I was a youngster, I used to watch my mother do that. And I, I thought, I, I couldn't believe that she was leaving, <clears throat> excuse me, the bones 
and the skin in in the dish, like you said, the fear of, of being choked, but um, it just shows the wisdom um, of, that those that our aunt, our mothers had of um, keeping a little bit of nutrition in the dish, right? Uh, that you get the calcium, you added calcium from the bones and um, additional flavor from the fat that's in the skin. So um, it just those two together give give you that texture. You don't you don't want to um, leave leave the, the step out. Yes. No one will know they're there once you're done. <laughs> you really can't tell that they're there. Now, my dad used to make a, um, don't you know you have cream chip beef? Uh -huh. He used to make a chip beef with fish, with canned fish. However, my dad never did this. So we would have <laughs> bones in our teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, so. I can see those little bones as clear as day. Um, yeah. But... But that extra boost of calcium is important. It's, it's good. It's not, it's, it's good. <laughs> yeah. So right now I'm heating up the stove because for me, when I make this recipe, I like to render down my onions. Um, for me, it brings, it, it adds more flavor to the dish. And I'm going to add peppers to this dish as well. Nice. I love that. So we're just going to add a little bit of blended oil to the pan. What do you mean blended oil? So blended oil is a mixture of olive oil and canola oil. So you can cook it at a high temperature. And, and I that's use that because for everything. Oil, of, yeah, because sorry, olive oil olive oil will smoke at a high, at the high uh, temperature. Mm -hmm. So if you want, if you want the nutritious value of the monounsaturated oil, then you can't fry in oil, in olive oil exclusively. Um, it needs a little bit of uh, uh, the other for, for balance. So I'm going to add the onions and I'm not going to add all the peppers. I like to taste the peppers, but I'm not going to add all the peppers to it. I think that's a great tip because then you're, you get an evenness in the uh, mixture. Like you won't have the ones that are on the outside, maybe a little bit more brown than those that are in their part of the croquette. Exactly. So they'll all be cooked um, through. I, I like that tip. And I'm going to clean this zest out real quick. I'm going to zest some garlic over here because just like Tony, I love garlic and everything. <laughs> yeah. Now you, this is the second time you've said that, that you're zesting. <laughs> garlic. Um, why do you do that instead of uh, mincing it? I'm sorry. Why do you uh, zest your garlic instead of mincing it? Well, with the zested garlic, it kind of blends a little bit better into the dish. It disappears into the dish. Ah, okay. Yeah, with mincing it, you might still have a couple of chunks in there. Um, another chef friend of mine showed me this trick, and since he showed me this, I've loved it, and I've just been doing it since. I love it, too. I'm going to start that. Um, the other thing I think is important to note here um, for our viewers is that you did not add the garlic to the pan with the other vegetables. It's small um, and it tends to fork easily. So throughout Jubilee, you will notice that I start the aromatic vegetables, celery, um, peppers and onions, um, and get them on their way for a couple minutes and then add the garlic um, later. That's also because as you notice, she did not use a lot of oil there. Um, and because African-Americans um, suffer from health disparities, um, I have tried to focus in this book on not using so much oil and so much salt and leaving that to the discretion of the cook. So when you don't have a lot of fat in the pan to be a buffer, you want to really be careful and not add that garlic right away so that it doesn't. 
Now I'm just adding the rest of the So what are you up to now? I'm adding the celery, cayenne, smoked paprika, eggs, lemon juice, and some toasted breadcrumbs. I'm looking at these breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs on the stove. Okay, sister. I, I'm not noticing any uh, smoked paprika in Jubilee. Oh, the smoked paprika was Tell also about that. in the um, cayenne. Okay. That's a nice, <laughs> just a tiny little bit, I suspect. Oh, we can always add more. No, no, I'm asking. So smoke. I'm asking. So is it, are you using just a little, just to, you know, torque up the flavor a little bit? Well, there we go. Well, I, I don't want to, I want to keep the color of the croquettes. Okay. Um, and that's all. I love the smokiness of smoked paprika. Yeah. Okay. I'm only adding a little bit of breadcrumbs at a time. I don't want to add too much. Matter of fact, we're about to get down and dirty. Okay. Uh, but I know what that means. Yes. Yes. So I was interviewed a long time ago about what I thought was uh, my ancestors' most important kitchen tool, and I said our hands. And and you're demonstrating that right here. Um, we have lost touch with our food. Uh, we've become uh, a nation of people cooking quick and fast, and we're out of touch. You know, you just need to feel the. the understand when that's really mixed. You'll be able to tell because the, the moisture will be um, absorbed. And then and also, if you're doing good. this with the canned salmon, just in case you didn't get all the bones, grind them down. By uh -huh. you using your hands, you'll be able to fill right. whatever, whatever what other bones are still in there. Absolutely. And this is not like a crab cake. We make uh, that point in the book as well, that in a crab cake, the idea is uh, there's so little uh, filler and other binding with the crab um, that you don't, the opposite is true. You don't want to overhandle it and overmix it. Mm -hmm. You really just want to pat that crab with whatever you're binding with it with and scoop it into the pan. But this is a, uh, this is a totally different mixture. And and modern uh, African American cookbooks always have a recipe for crab cakes and salmon croquettes in them. Uh, if there's a consistent recipe across our generation, salmon croquettes is one of them, um, and it's an expression of our culture. Whether um, it is part of the soul food canon and uh, thought more of sur survival and, and um, uh, food that was made with whatever one had on hand. You know, you might always have a can of fish there, um, but it's also considered um, something for eating a little bit higher uh, on, on the menu. Um, we had them for breakfast. My mother made them as a dinner. How did you grow up having them? My parents never made me any. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. Okay. No, it was. It was a special, like if, if we had any type of um, crab cakes or we never had salmon cakes. Okay. Um, but mainly it would, my dad would eat them. Oh, but, yeah. But we wasn't um, privy to that. <laughs> However, growing up in my house, my children have had crab cakes, salmon cakes. Um, so it was a regular thing in our home. Mm-hmm. I think some of that may be generational too. As I'm I sure. about, you know, um, the dishes that we have let slide out of our repertoire, you know, as we, because if we associate it with, with can somehow it's more homely, right? We got into the spirit of eating more fresh salmon, I think. Yeah. Uh, in modern day. So, uh, and also this requires frying. And there are a lot of folks that don't uh, want to do that much frying anymore. So- And it, uh, it is a lot of work. Like done? I know if I make- Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, I'm I watching- When I make my crab cakes, 
um, like you said, is more intensive. Um, you have the mayonnaise in there. You have uh, the Dijon mustard, uh, at least for me, mm -hmm. um, your eggs, and, and then basically everything else that you have here, Tony, as well. Right. You know, the, the toasted breadcrumbs. I really love the, toosting your breadcrumbs. And, yes, um, it adds a, a different dimension to your dishes. Yes, and the the I think the soul food rendering of this, you might uh, see uh, more use of crackers, right? You know, it's, I'm thinking about my mother and Ritz crackers were a thing. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, which again adds another flavor profile. So. so. All right, so on the stove, I've been heating the oil. I've used the same pan that I used, that I rendered down the onions and peppers with. I wiped it out, but I want to keep that flavor in there for me. Mm -hmm. um, it'll just add more flavor to our salmon. And we see this is pan frying, not deep fat frying. Yes. I'm going to put a little bit of salt on each. So to test your oil, to see if it's um, hot enough, just pinch a little bit of salt on there. If you hear the sizzle, then your oil's ready. Good tip. I'm putting the salmon cakes down salt side first. Why? Um, it'll help it to, it'll help to release it from the pan. And oh, it'll, the it'll that? seal that salt into it. The, the salt helps with the release or the, that's, what do you mean? So whenever I'm searing anything, I'll make sure I put salt and pepper on the skin. If it's a fish on the side, that's going to go down because it helps, it helps the crisp, it helps it crisp it up mm -hmm. and by it crisping up is easier to move. It's e it'll slide easier. What a great tip, especially again, because there's not a lot of oil in that pan. Um, and I'm drawing attention to that because of the, you know, often criticism that our food is unhealthy. Um, and so we have convinced ourselves that we can't eat our, the food of our culture and th that couldn't be further from the truth. So you don't need a lot of fat. What you're saying is, uh, I, I think you also uh, helped us see that by having pan hot, also, uh, before you put the oil in there, right? Is that what you did? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I always make sure, always make sure you have a hot pan. Never put, if you're searing fish, if you're searing meats, uh, crab cakes, make sure you heat your pan up first. You do not want to put your food in a cold pan. And we're just going to sear these for two to three minutes on both sides. Um, salmon is already cooked, so you're not, you don't have to cook it until it's well done. Right. Just long enough to cook that egg. Ooh. Hot pan. Now, since this pan is hot for me, I'm going to turn it off because the pan is hot already. You know, you don't need it to continue cooking. You don't need the fire still on for the salmon cakes to continue cooking. Y'all hear that sizzle? Yeah. We do want to make sure that, that we get that egg cooked, though, in the center, right? Yes. So that it, um, you want them to be moist, um, but not sticky. What drew your attention to this recipe in the book? I love, I honestly, I, I love salmon. Salmon is a good fish. It's, it's the only fish that you can eat every single day. 
So, um, and it remind and and I love crab cakes. Crab cake is a popular dish. Mm -hmm. um, so this is. And it's quick. <laughs> it's a quick dish. I always keep a couple of uh, cans of red or pink salmon. The red is uh, even more healthy for you than the pink, uh, but it is more expensive. And um, I always make sure that I have a couple of cans in my pantry. Um, and they also make good quarantine food. So I talk to my kids about making sure that they're... Uh, quarantine pantry had canned uh, salmon in it. But could you use a little bit more oil? What would be different? You said, can I use a little bit more oil? I said, if you had more, a little more oil in the pan, what happens to the dish? Nothing will happen to the dish. I just, for me, I just don't like, I don't want the oil to absorb into the salmon cakes. I don't use a lot of oil in my dishes. Um, totally. I'm going to reference when I was on HK, I was searing scallops one time and I put a lot of oil on there and I got yelled at. Chef asked okay. me if I was frying them. <laughs> so I only use enough oil that I need. I only use the oil that I need for the dish. Excellent. I, that was the point I wanted you to make, that um, there is definitely a difference between a, a light sear saute um, pan frying and deep fat frying. Yes. And our ancestors were not, this perception that they deep fat fried everything is just not accurate. Um, uh, I think that that habit comes on because of um, processed, you know, fast food uh, and the need to cook things fast. And then at home, we cook them fast. We don't have to watch as closely. I don't know. There's a multiple dynamics happening there, but I love that you're communicating and showing that it's not necessary. All right. So now that the croquettes are done, How I like to eat them is to have a little bit of remoulade that I put on the bottom mm -hmm. of the plate and just spread it out. I don't need, uh, cause the salmon cakes or the salmon croquettes are going to sit on top of this so that when you take it, when you take a piece off of it, you're already scooping some of the sauce on there. Very nice. It's artistic too, makes the plate look pretty. Yes. I'm now, hungry. I'm only gonna put a couple on here because with the other dishes, I wanna make sure I save some for our other dishes. Okay. What I also have is a roasted pepper bruschetta that I'm gonna put on top. And on the side, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and a little bit of feta cheese with black pepper. Ooh. Yes. I see how this became a favorite. <laughs> a wonderful adaptations of garnishes. And, you know, people should see the... I do not make that suggestion. So I think it's fabulous that you, um, you know, relied on your own taste buds and, and what you know, sounded good to you. Uh, we should be yes. more free to try different things like that. Not just the standard Let's add some green green. parsley. Although, is that what you're doing now? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have the salmon croquettes. Beautiful. You made me hungry. All right. That made me hungry. <laughs> so we're going to move on here to a little bit further back into the book and talk about some vegetables and salad. And um, I want to show this photograph because it's just so compelling. We're about to have, um, whoops, that way, sweet potato salad. 
Now, those of you that are accustomed to the African-American tradition of country potato salad, uh, as she worked that the potatoes with her, uh, the salmon cake, um, you know, one of the classic techniques of African-Americans uh, in making potato salad is to just smash it up just a little bit and get that creamy texture that's the addition to the potatoes um and i wanted something different i we do talk about country potato salad here in the book uh, but this recipe is a tribute to chef patrick clark who we lost in the 90s um and he was my first chef interview when i was working for the la times and we also were working together on his book proposal uh at the time uh, that we lost him so um, this is a recipe that seems a little bit uh, newer in our um, canon. Um, it's made by several other chefs. So I think it, it, you know, if I had to categorize it, I would say that it is one of those chef-y interpretations, just like the way that um, Chef Z uh, just decorated and garnished that plate so beautifully. Um, and so uh, this recipe can be found as far back as the 70s. Um, I think it was the 70s, but it's in it's in the works of Vertime Grosner, um, who was a chef and host on uh, NPR. Um, it's also uh, in the Neely's cookbook. And um, B. Smith, the late B. Smith, whom we just lost, um, also had an adaptation of this salad in her her book. So I made them all individually first and then um, took the best of each one and then that's the recipe that Chef is demonstrating next. All right, so what I started so, so far is um, peeling the potato. I'm going to peel it and then I'm going to dice the potatoes into quarter inch squares. I really hope you can talk a little bit about the process of dicing versus chopping because um, part of the reason this dish is so pretty um, is that I specifically wanted those cubes to be uh, in dice as opposed to a coarse erratic chop. It, when you, as opposed, I like dicing it because it, I want to taste the potato, you know, I want to taste, um, when you dice it and it stays whole, you get the, the firmness of the potato. Just like I want to just in the recipe book, you have it that we're going to boil the potato. Whereas today I'm going to roast the potatoes. Excellent. It gives it a nice bounce, um, a nice give back. Um, so it's still going to look the same. <laughs> well, you also get that wonderful caramelization that happens when you roast them. Yes. Uh, I and love you keep all the nutrients in there. Right. Um, I love that. I don't know if I'll ever boil them again. <laughs> uh, roasted sweet potatoes diced this way um, is a, a dish that I made often for my family. Uh, just like you have there, I would toss them with olive oil and salt. And after they were roasted, mm -hmm. I would just put the pan at the end of the counter. And as the kids were coming and going, you know, before dinner time, they'd eat them like little pieces of candy. And, you know, it's just a sneaky way to get extra vegetables in when everybody's, you know, looking around for that pre dinner bite. Um, and they would have already had their vegetable by then. Um, and they were pretty and they take count. Kind of, this was, I was doing this before we were ordering um, sweet potato fries. Um, because you do get that little browning on the edges of them. If you roast them in high heat. Yes. I roast them on 350 degrees for 20 minutes. So I just put some oil on there. Is this your combined oil again? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, salt and pepper. I use kosher salt and pepper. We're Do just going to make sure all the sweet potatoes are evenly coated. Do you find differences between the saltiness of salt? 
Are you brand loyal? I do. Um, okay. Regular table salt, when I'm cooking, honestly, it's too salty for me. Mm. Um, I've, I've, I've been in restaurants, I've worked in restaurants where instead of kosher salt, they have table salt to sear their food with. And for me, it just doesn't work. Okay. I think that's good to know, too. Now, Not there's just- also different kinds of kosher salts that you can use. Um, different kosher salts um, break down differently, but that's a whole nother discussion. I use diamond kosher salt. Yeah. So we're going to roast these for 20 minutes. Luckily, <laughs> we already have some roasted. <laughs> you are a magician. Yes. <laughs> so... In a mixing bowl, I'm going to, wait a minute. I had a bigger mixing bowl. Um, in a mixing bowl, I'm going to add the maple syrup. Some um, balsamic vinegar. This is white wine. Wait a minute, no, it's not. We're not gonna have that. <laughs> so now it calls for black raisins. I have currants in there. Mm-hmm. And golden raisins. Then the walnuts. Oh. We're about to miss one of the most important ingredients, orange juice. Some fresh grated nutmeg and ginger. This is this dish is like having a uh, veritable Thanksgiving, all the veritable flavors of Thanksgiving in, wrapped in one dish. I noticed that in the fall, when Jubilee was published, uh, lots of the um, reviewers uh, <laughs> used this recipe, uh, obviously because of the holiday time and and those uh, aromas and the availability. Of, you know, class having sweet potatoes on your Thanksgiving table is great. So you use that um, zester a lot. I have it's several of these. Tip. It's a great. <laughs> tip. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I do. Do you have a ginger peeling tip? Do you use that spoon tip. I don't. If you don't have a peeler, then yes, use a spoon. Okay. And once you're done, let's say I have this. Well, since I have this left over, you can put this in a freezer. And if you grate it, that way it's, it, when you grate it, it's hard enough and it'll grate easier. Waste not. All right. So now we're going to take these sweet potatoes. We're gonna mix everything together. Now you wanna be careful because you do not want to mess up the shape of the sweet potatoes. And we're gonna add some parsley and some green onions to this to add some color to it. Parsley. I find a rubber scraper is very helpful for stirring because you can run it around the inside. Yeah. And that way you don't uh, smash. Oh, yeah, like that. 
<laughs> we are on the same wavelength. <laughs> this looks amazing. I wish you could smell it. I wish we had smell a vision. I do too. I'm, it makes me want to go in the kitchen and make some right now. <laughs> and then we're just going to let this sit. We're going to put it in the fridge and let this cool off. Doesn't that look great? I wish, let me yeah. see. Here we go. <laughs> Love it. And you know, one thing that is really wonderful too about um, having the slightly warmed potatoes is that the flavors of the dressing penetrate uh, better. So you want to cool them down to, you know, room temperature so they're not too hot, but, but they uh, absorb the vinaigrette really well. All right. You want to tell us anything more about uh, that dish before we go on? Oh, no. no. <laughs> All right. All right. Then the, uh, we have two to go. Uh, we're going to uh, stick with the vegetable theme and make green beans a la Creole. And that sort of speaks for itself uh, in the African American tradition uh, in my historic cookbook. I discovered that uh, whenever African American uh, cooks and authors would um, use tomatoes, they would call the dish a la Creole. So it didn't necessarily reflect Louisiana cooking um, or even have the uh, holy trinity of the aromatic vegetables that we think about when we're making roux or jambalaya. Um, it, it really was a, a means of uh, communicating the inclusion of tomatoes. And green beans are a prolific summer garden vegetable. Um, and so I just wanted us to be able to show that they were, that they were conversant in cooking green beans in ways other than the Southern tradition of uh, what we think of with a piece of fat meat smoky, um, maybe some red new potatoes. You know, we all recognize that as a Southern way with green beans. Uh, but we wanted to show uh, something different here. So I'll let you uh, talk about the dish. All right. So here we have all of our seasonings that's going to go in the pan. This is a fairly simple, quick dish. Um, these are fresh green beans. I blanched them in salted water. Um, then we shot them with ice so that, can, so that they can stop the cooking process and they keep this pretty green color. I'm going to put it. I love this color. It's so pretty. Mm -hmm. So after you blanch them, you want to make sure you put them in cold water so that you shock it and stop the cooking process. On the stove, I have the pan heating. Once the pan is heated up, I'm going to add the bacon fat some onions, garlic, smoked paprika, cayenne, and black pepper. And then we're gonna rinse, and then we're gonna just cook those just for a little bit. Um, after that, we're gonna add the green beans, and here we have diced tomatoes and chili peppers. It's canned diced tomatoes and chili peppers. And we're gonna add all that together, and we're gonna cook it. Being as though your green beans are already cooked, you don't have to wait until they are army green. <laughs> right. I, I know a lot of people green. like to cook their greens until they're like dark because that's when they're done. But but they're vegetables. They're always done. They're done when they're raw, except potatoes. And you could use uh, that combination oil if you wanted to. Um, the bacon uh, drippings are not required, but they were a, an homage back to that southern uh, practice of using smoked meat all the time. But I take all it right. you like that smoky thing happening in the dip because you also add smoked paprika too. That's very cool. Yeah. I, listen, I love me some smoked paprika. Me too. And it's such a great little cheat <laughs> for a vegetarian, for, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, for vegetarians. So I have vegetarians in my family and we make this dish 
I like to make this dish around Christmas time because of the red and green together. Um, and the smoked paprika is such a great way to mimic the flavor of the meat and you don't miss it. Now by adding the seasonings to the pan, we're doing the same thing we did with the um, pickling spices. We are getting the flavor out of the seasonings. These are all dry seasonings. So to get the flavor that. and to, let me see, what's the word I'm looking for? To enhance the flavor of your Absolutely. dish. Mm -hmm. You want to bring that out of your dry seeds. Your, your dry herbs don't have any flavor to them unless, you, well, they do, but. Well, it, draw, it just want, draws out more of it. You're absolutely right. Um, yes. Again, with the zest and the garlic. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like garlic, you don't have to add it. Um, and you don't even have to add a lot of garlic. But I do. <laughs> <laughs> now, we don't want to cook that too long because we don't want to burn um, the garlic or anything else. We want to keep it nice and pretty and translucent. We're going to add our green beans and we're going to add our, our tomatoes and peppers. Mmm. That fat. And you know, this is also a wonderful solution, again, as we're quarantined and confined and trying to think of new ways to cook all these self-stable foods that we've had to resort to. Um, you could use canned green beans, not because you would do that every day, <laughs> but this would be a great way to brighten up the flavor of canned beans. You just drain them. Uh, I would even rinse them to get the added salt off of them. Uh, and then you are you don't feel as deprived um, when we're in this COVID situation. So add canned green beans and canned tomatoes to your um, COVID pantry. But army green is definitely different than this beautiful bright green. <laughs> it definitely is. <laughs> you notice Chef did not chime in saying, yeah, 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 use those canned green beans. <laughs> <laughs> no way. The only time I use canned greens is um, honestly when I cook for my family and I'm making string beans um, because it cooks longer in, in the broth. You know, when you're making... I want to say traditional uh -huh. green beans because that's how I grew up. Um, but with the smoked turkey, the onions, and all the aromatics in there, that's when I buy the canned green beans. Okay, I am well, not. I, I don't want my fresh green beans. writing me. I don't want to see it on Twitter that I suggested that people uh, become canned <laughs> green bean eaters. I'm suggesting that as a crisis gift. <laughs> I want that to be, you know, overstated. It's beautiful. And I'm just, it smells amazing. I'm just looking for my white plate because I okay. want to plate it up for you. All right. It's oh, a good farmer's market. There we go. Two. So this is another dish that um, you can use your salmon croquettes with. Looks like dinner. So we have the salmon croquettes. We're gonna add some of this beautiful Sweet potato salad. And then our green beans a la creole.
That's the way cooking should make you feel. You know? <laughs> it is something really healthy, something beautiful, something delicious. Um, it's good for your family. It's good for the soul. And um, that's really what I wanted to accomplish with this book oh. and, and celebrating our ancestors. Uh, but also giving all of you, the modern chefs, the opportunity to uh, you know, show off what you guys are all about. We, we need to know more about Black chefs in this country and the competencies and expertise that you guys have uh, you know, spent so much time and effort developing. The, I'm, I'm sorry, Tony. My headpiece actually fell in the pot with the green beans. <laughs> so some oh, of what no. you said. <laughs> I was just praising, singing your praises. I'm sorry. I was singing your praises. That's all. I was coming uh, to you. <laughs> this? Mmm. It's so good. It's so good. And there it goes again. <laughs> Tony, I wish you was with me right now. I wish I, would I would give you too. a huge hug. I wish I was amazing. There. It looks great. Man, I, I really hope um, those of you that are watching try these recipes because they are good. They are really good. Um, whether you stick to the recipe in the book or whether you add your own twist to it, these are great. Mm. But don't drop your earpiece. <laughs> yes, don't drop your earpiece in the food. <laughs> I love it. I love, well, you know, that's the beauty of the, uh, well, I guess the bandana didn't cover the ears, but I have written that the power, we're reclaiming the power of the bandana as well. You know, it was used as a way to disparage African-American women uh, who were cooks. And we saw that in those very early Aunt Jemima images. But having your hair uh, in a beautiful uh, scarf as you do is a way to protect the integrity of your dish, right? And it also helps keep the smell of the food out of your hair. So our ancestors were wise in so many ways and it's just been a joy to uh, share them with everybody. Um, I'm thrilled that you guys are, you're enjoying cooking out of Jubilee. So what you have left is we're gonna have one last beverage. Uh, this is the uh, hot apple toddies. And um, oh. we, we don't talk a lot about African-American mixologists, but that's going to be uh, the subject of uh, one of my future books. And um, we'll be talking quite a bit about the history of cocktail making. And hot potties are one of those uh, drinks that um, serves in two sort of two, two ways. Um, I thought of it as a way to uh, soothe when you don't feel well. That's what my growing up memory of potties is all about. Um, bourbon, um, uh, warmed um, with you know a little lemon and honey. Um, but this, the story that goes with this recipe, um, it comes from a chef in. Um, uh, coastal Mississippi, and he was a caterer and talked about making this dish for a crowd like uh, punch. And so uh, I'll let Chef Z tell you a little bit more about the making of it. All right, thank you. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm going to slice the apples. Well, how I'm going to cut these apples. Is I'm going to cut it in half. Now in the book, it tells you to core it though. All right. This is just how I'm doing it. And I'm only doing this because um, it just fits better in my glass. <laughs> And not just that, just different, just knowing different ways um, or different techniques to cut apples. Right. In the book, they're cut um, 
circular. Yeah. So they you just use an apple core to uh, remove that center. And these we're just cutting into half moons. On the stove, I have warming up um, one quart of water. Once I'm done slicing the apples, I'm going to add the apples to it. We're going to add um, cloves. We're going to add whole cloves, cinnamon sticks, and brown sugar. The wonderful winter soothing, soothing drink for winter. It's a great winter drink. It reminds me of um, hot, hot apple cider. I beg your pardon, of what? It reminds me of hot apple cider. Oh, right, right. And you know, when I was a food editor at the Plain Dealer in Cleveland, um, I used to take my kids out uh, apple harvesting in the fall. You could go out to the orchard and there would be warm apple cider and uh, the kids could run around. And it was just a wonderful way to um, keep them busy on weekends and to teach them about where their food comes from. Um, and so there's multiple inspirations in this uh, dish because I don't like a lot of sweet drinks. Uh, so warm apple cider isn't my favorite, but this is an, uh, an adaptation of that. So now what I'm doing is I'm just putting the whole cloves inside of the lemon. I'm going to take our ingredients. We're going to move over to the stove. As you see, the water is hot. I'm going to add my sugar first. I need a nice spoon. Thank you. Did you make uh, any adaptations to this dish? Honest, I like the dish how it is. The only thing I will add to it is um, nothing. No, I like the I like the dish how it is. There's nothing different that I want to change about this dish. Yeah, yeah, and it comes out of that tradition of the the John toddy, like I was saying. Um, but it does have. It, it will remind you of of hot apple cider. Now we're going to let that steep for a minute. And after it steeps, we're going to add. Now it says um, the recipe does call for either apple um, tea bags or ginger tea bags. Um, I actually, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> Um, you can't see it. What is it? This is the oh. um, apple cider. Can you okay. see it? Uh huh. Got it. Um, and we still do have the ginger, but I'm going to add these two. Yeah. To our uh, to our pan to our pot once it's done. 
Now, what's, you want to wait until it's done to add it. Well, since we're getting close on time, why don't um, we do that magic TV switcheroo thing? <laughs> um, well, this was the only magic we don't do, but we could do this. Oh my goodness, time flew by so fast. It did, that's what I was saying. We're, um, we're running <laughs> out of time. You were really good. Oh, well, you made me, well thank you, you partner. You, you made me hungry <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I think, I think you've really done a great job of showing people um, how important it is to personalize your own cooking, right? I, I, I provide these recipes as a, uh, a window and a, into how it's done and give a lot of detail um, because I want you to feel comfortable making whatever flavor changes you like. This smells so good. And this, you do not want to cool off. This, you want to drink it nice and hot. So I'm going to get a glass mug. And in my glass mug, I'm going to add my secret ingredient, AKA rum. Oh, you like rum. I love rum. And rum is my favorite um, liquor. Well, that's it's very, my, it's, it's my go-to. Yeah. And you know what? You know, I, I wish I did have a um, kitchen staff. Like, don't you know on, on cooking shows, you always have things that you already need? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know what? It's all right table. because... Yeah. Everyone that's watching understands. Yes, they don't have a dishwasher either. I'm certain. Uh, All right. All right. Well, thank so you this so much to a boil. for coming my book. Ooh, that looks great. And it smells fantastic. Honestly, let me say, because I don't want to make a mess on the cutting board. Well, no. We'll be okay. There we go. Oh, yes. Mm hmm And I'm going to scoop some of these apples out in lemons. Lemons are good for you. Um, it helps with your throat. It helps with your stomach. Um, it's just a yeah. great um, citrus to work with. Yeah. And lastly, you want to grade. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to grade the the um, nutmeg over your drink. Mm hmm. And your grater is not your zester, or is it? Are they are you using the same? I use I use the same. Um, okay. You do have smaller tooth ones, but um, what I noticed with the, I don't. I just don't like. I don't. I don't like how fine. Um, there it is. Okay. Fine it looks. Yeah. Oh, there go my headset. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. That is so beautiful. Mm. <sighs> it's 
smells amazing. And there you have your hot toddy, your apple hot toddy. Salmon croquettes, two ways. Pickle shrimp salad. And your hibiscus tea. Oh, how beautiful. I'm gonna take a picture of the screen. <laughs> Thank you, Chef. It's just been a You're delight to be here with you. I just really had a great time. I had a wonderful time cooking all of these dishes. It was so much fun, and and thank you for having me. Oh, I learned so much, and I hope our guests did too. Thanks for having us. Hi, thank you. This was tremendous. I was backstage watching all of this and I'm just getting hungry and hungry the whole time. <laughs> um, you were both so inspiring and everything you talked about and everything you said, I'm back here furiously writing notes and um, getting all these recipes organized. So now I'm going to try some stuff out. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had one question in the chat that I thought would be really great for uh, both of you to talk about, um, if that was okay. Sure. All okay. right, so the question was, what are some new dimensions to African-American cooking that are trending right now? Uh, well, one of the things that we're seeing is a lot more chefs tapping into diasporan cooking. So we are seeing West African cooking um, and, and specifically, right? People are talking about the food in terms of it, their unique regions. Senegalese cooking, Nigerian cooking. Um, and so African-Americans are starting to really diversify the food. And I think that's been the success of Jubilee and the Jemima Code is to give everyone freedom to appreciate um, all of the different aspects of our uh, food, tracing it back to its very beginning. So that's what I'm doing. That's beautiful, thank you. All right, and then this is, this is my question because I am super curious. What are both of your go-to foods that you just love to eat and love to cook? I'll let you um, go My go-to food um, is French fries. <laughs> <laughs> Truth be told, it's French fries. French fries are my Achilles heel. Um, uh, other than that, shrimp. I love shrimp. It's a light um, protein and it's filling. Um, I'm not a big meat eater, so um, seafood, but shrimp is my go-to. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have um, two habits. Um, we absolutely love anything that goes on the grill. So grilled vegetables, um, I can just take a bunch of them and put them in a bowl and have them as a meal with very little on them. Um, but it, it, when I was growing up and especially raising my kids, tacos were our go to thing, you know, when, when we were growing up, we used our allowance to, to buy the fixings, you know, all the ingredients for them. And it just became a comfort food um, for me with, with our African American kinds of twists on it. Um, uh, and so they're not classic street Mexican tacos, um, but tacos for sure. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing. And thank you both for participating. Uh, even though we didn't get to do it face to face, I think this was a beautiful substitute. I think so. It was Thank great. You. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. All right. And, and we'll can you let our let your viewers know that anybody that's interested, um, we did they they probably haven't gotten there yet, but I did sign some book plates for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yep. Once we um once we let you two go, I have a whole thing. I'm gonna tell them how to get your book. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you both. Bye. Thank you. All right. 
So I wanted to thank everybody that watched with us tonight, our members, our museum staff, specifically Maggie and Dara. Thank you again for running this whole show. A big thank you to Art Bridges Foundation for supporting this program. More importantly, everyone viewing, everyone uh, that registered. I want to remind you that Tony's book, Jubilee, um, uh, Jubilee Recipes from Two Centuries of African-American Cooking, is available for purchase on the Westmoreland's online museum shop. Now, I do want to let you know there is a 10% discount for members. So if you're not a member, you can become a member on our website. Um, also, make sure to check out the museum's website, thewestmoreland.org, for any upcoming virtual programs. We have a lot of stuff coming down the pike, so make sure to tune back in. Thank you again, and have an excellent night.